Hello, my name is Darlene Sherrill, and I've been involved with reading, writing, and talking about fluoride for more than 30 years. This is a message about new sources of fluoride in both foods and beverages. It's about what fluoride can do to ruin a young child's permanent teeth before you even see them, and what it can do to cripple both children and adults with a condition usually misdiagnosed as arthritis. In the summer of 1976, I thought fluoride was good for dental health and absolutely safe. Then I met a woman who said it was poison. I knew she had to be wrong. I had given my older daughter fluoride supplements years earlier, before it was added to our tap water. Why would they put poison in vitamins for toddlers? But a few weeks later, when I finally took the time to check, it was like being transported to Wonderland with Alice and the White Rabbit. The history of man's use of fluoride for dental health is so bizarre, so complicated, so far-reaching, and so important it has kept my attention to this day because the story isn't over. In fact, it changed my life because I learned that by avoiding fluoride as much as possible, my allergies, asthma, arthritis, and gastrointestinal problems would go away and stay away as long as I was very careful with my diet and used nothing but distilled water for drinking and cooking. From childhood, I'd had frequent and long-lasting aching bones and severe muscle cramps in my legs and stiff and swollen joints in my hands. At first, doctors said it was rheumatism, but later they called it rheumatoid arthritis. However, Within a year of changing my diet, 10 years before even considering fluoride, all of that was gone. I have been pain-free since 1967, except for those rare occasions when I've been careless and eaten too much of something I wasn't sure about. Within hours, I get the message and stop eating whatever it was. Most of the time, everything is back to normal within a day or two. But it can also take months. It happened to me in 1995 from air pollution in Trinidad. This stuff is definitely poison. Apparently, I'm one of a small percentage of people who are unusually sensitive to fluoride. I know several people who have been diagnosed with systemic fluoride poisoning and they share many of my symptoms. Most of us have gone through a double blind test with fluoridated and non fluoridated water to rule out other causes. No one really knows how many people have been poisoned because there haven't been any studies capable of detecting them until the advanced stage of crippling skeletal fluorosis. Arthritis and other health problems caused by fluoride don't count when it comes to water and pesticide regulations. Only the final stage, described as crippling deformities of the spine and major joints with neurological deficits due to compression of the spinal cord. It's a lot like saying cancer is okay as long as you're not dead. In 1977, the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, NASNRC, published a book called Drinking Water and Health. In it, they expressed concern that the then current daily intake estimates were as high as 4 to 5 milligrams. And if these estimates are accurate, people might be retaining as much as 2 milligrams of fluoride daily, which for the typical individual is enough to cause phase 3 crippling skeletal fluorosis after 40 years. Before that time, everyone thought people were still getting the same dosage they got during the 1940s one and a half milligrams per day in areas where there was one milligram of fluoride in each liter of water. At that time, they didn't have fluoride toothpaste or other dental products, and sources of fluoride other than drinking water provided only about one quarter milligram per day. For that reason, doctors, dentists, and research scientists made assumptions based on the concentration of fluoride in a water supply, not the actual quantity of fluoride ingested by the people. Then, in 1997, the Institute of Medicine, IOM, which is also part of NASNRC, told us we've always been getting 4 milligrams per day in areas with one part per million fluoride in the water supply, even though they cited the same reference that reported it as 1.5 milligrams per day in 1943. It's the only reference they cite that was published prior to 1979, yet the numbers are completely different. What's strange is that in 1989, IOM's recommended dietary allowances said 1.5 milligrams per day was optimum, but warned against exceeding 4 milligrams per day in order to avoid the development of crippling skeletal fluorosis. Then, just a few years later, they raised the recommended intake from 1.5 to 4 milligrams and raised the tolerable intake from 4 to 10 milligrams with no new research other than one man who mentioned another man 
who had used some high fluoride water from age 22 to age 30 without developing crippling skeletal fluorosis. The water was high in magnesium and sulfate, so it wasn't used much for drinking and cooking. Believe it or not, that's the proof that water fluoridation, as well as current pesticide residue tolerances, are safe. That's modern science for you. The same dose is crippling one day and safe the next, depending on the economic and political climate surrounding the poison itself. However, what you need to know is that EPA, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, recently approved a new pesticide with tolerances for fluoride residues on some basic items higher than 100 milligrams per kilo. Sulfurofluoride is a fumigant used to kill insects in food warehouses and processing plants. Tolerances for pesticide residues have been approved by EPA and they apply to virtually all agricultural products. That means that if you purchase foods or beverages made with ingredients that were fumigated with sulfurofluoride, and that includes just about every item you can name, what was once relatively safe to eat is now highly questionable. Here's what happened. They were phasing out the use of methyl bromide because of concerns about the ozone layer, and one of the agribusiness giants asked for and received permission to use their product on virtually everything. EPA's pesticide division set residue tolerances for various foods and food groups which they consider safe as long as the end result, the total daily intake of fluoride for humans, doesn't exceed a maximum of 8 milligrams. What matters is that thanks to EPA, people who were once exposed to a maximum of about 2 milligrams of fluoride daily can now look forward to ingesting as much as 8 milligrams someday. It could be worse. About 10 years ago, the Manchester Guardian ran a story with photos of two children who were badly crippled because they drank water from a relatively new borehole dug too deep in an area of India known for rich mineral deposits. The water had only 11 parts per million of fluoride, but almost all the children are not need and have the brown stained teeth characteristic of the first stages of fluoride poisoning. In China, the problem comes from air pollution because of rapid industrial development, and that translates to polluted water and food as well, even without considering artificial fertilizers and pesticides. Millions of children have already been badly crippled because of fluoride. Tea has always been a significant source of fluoride because of the nature of the plant itself. But recent analysis of green and black tea from China and India revealed it can now deliver six or more milligrams per cup. Meats and fish don't contain much fluoride, but their bones do. And if cooked in a liquid, the fluoride stored in those bones will contaminate the broth. If you use corned beef from a can, hot dogs, salami, processed luncheon meats, hamburger, sausage, or any ground meats that were separated from the bone by machine rather than by hand, there will be tiny little chips of bone, too small to see, and because of that, the concentration of fluoride in these processed meats can be as high as 35 milligrams per kilo. If you use a fluoride toothpaste, you will probably absorb about one-third of a milligram per use providing you rinse well and spit it all out after brushing. When infants and young children get too much fluoride, any more than about one half to one milligram per day, their permanent teeth can be so badly disfigured and damaged they'll need a lifetime of expensive cosmetic dentistry. With just a little too much, instead of translucent pearly white enamel on their two front teeth, they have extra white lines along the biting edge flex or an overall unnaturally porous white enamel that picks up stains easily. Fluoride is one of the most abundant elements in the Earth's crust. So any time we have to take something out of the ground to manufacture something else, there will be fluoride involved in one way or the other. And that's the root of the problem. After all, what doesn't come out of the ground? It's where we get the materials for everything we use on a daily basis, and massive amounts of fluoride wastes liberated during the manufacturing process must be disposed of somehow. This isn't about science. It's about politics and national security issues. Fluoride is known as the protected pollutant, 
Its reputation as a safe cavity fighter was created out of thin air by the U.S. government during a time when scientists were working furiously to make the first atomic bomb. We were at war. U.S. policymakers had good reason to deny the adverse effects of fluorine air pollution at the time. It was a matter of life and death. But that's not true today. Today, it's just a matter of profit and loss. Recently declassified documents from the Manhattan Project speak for themselves. This isn't a conspiracy theory. It's part of recorded history.